So in the current directory, we have got a web project. Let's look at it in Visual Studio Code. You can see we've got an Azure pipeline. We have a web project, a standard template. Look at the link at the top right uh, in the video where I walk you through creating this .NET Core standard project and setting up a vanilla pipeline. Let's look at the branch that we're currently working on. Wondering how to set up a basic .NET Core pipeline? Check out the link on the top right for the video that I just did previously. Now there's a problem with this pipeline. It's very procedural, one step after the other step. Now if you look at the actual pipeline itself, you would see that it's a monolith. We just see one uh, heading called job, and under that we've got steps. Now imagine if step number three fails or step number four fails, you basically will have to work through the entire process. Um, we can do better than this. Uh, but to demonstrate why this pipeline isn't ideal, let's just uh, go in into a test project and update a test and force it to fail. So I'm gonna open up uh, the demo test in Vim. Let me quickly edit the assert statement from one is equal to one to one is equal to um, two, and that's gonna force the test to fail. Let's uh, escape uh, colon WQ to save and come out of WIM. Here we are, so let's just um, confirm. That's the file that's pending changes. Let's stage the changes. Let's commit the changes. And let's uh, break this test. Now, uh, let's just give it a comment. Break unit test. We've committed the changes. So I'm gonna just push these changes up to the server now. Now, because I've got a CI process set up that would have triggered a pipeline, We'll go to that in a second. Let's just uh, clear the terminal and run this command to look at the history of the commits that we've done on the repo. Um, there's this switch called pretty is equal to one line. That's if I can spell one line correctly, which gives you a nice view of the history. Now you see our change to break the unit test has, has been committed and has been pushed up to the remote. Uh, that's where our head is at at the minute. Okay, so let's flip over. We can see in Azure DevOps pipelines that a, that, that a pipeline has been triggered for the .NET pipeline that, that I just showed you. Now, if we go in that pipeline, you know, obviously it was gonna fail because we failed the test. But you see, all you see here is a job and the jobs failed. Um, and you have to sort of go in and figure out which part of the job has failed. Now the job failing is one thing, but the real problem with this monolith pipeline is that I can't really scale this out. Now imagine if I had hundreds and thousands of tests and I just wanted to run the tests in a fan out mode where the tests get dished out to tens of agents to run in parallel, uh, then that's not possible because in the current model, the entire pipeline would have to work, uh, would have to run on all the agents. So. Let's address this, right? Let me show you uh, an approach to create more parallelism. And it's a, it's a step approach where first we'll have to uh, divide this monolith pipeline into multiple jobs. Uh, and then from there, we'll work through on those uh, next steps to fan that out. First off, let's go back to terminal and uncommit the change that we pushed in. So we're simply gonna use the git revert head command to undo the last commit and then uh, after we roll back, commit the changes locally and then push them up so that failing unit test gets fixed. So we're working on a clean slate. Now, uh, the, the git revert's better than doing a git rebase because uh, with git rebase, I would essentially be removing uh, and rewriting the history and I don't really wanna be doing that. And it would probably be okay to rewrite the history um, if I was the only developer working on this and no one had, had else had pulled the changes but if the others had pulled the changes, then me rewriting the history will mess up uh, their, their Git repo history uh, in their local. Um, okay, so we've, we've basically done the revert. We can see that showing up in the Git log. Um, now let's, let's just go into the myweb.test, demo test. We can see that we're back to sr ones equal to one. So that test will now be passing. Uh, now that we're back into a clean slate, let's um, clear the terminal and create a new git branch. So rather than do git branch and then give the branch name and then check out the branch, I could use the command git checkout uh, and then minus b, that way I'm creating the branch and checking it out in just one command. Let's just uh, call this new branch modeler pipeline because essentially that we're, that's exactly what we're doing. We're creating a modeler.net pipeline. 
um, to get away from that monolith that we saw and the disadvantages that come with it. Okay, let's uh, go into code and publish this branch so that it's available on the remote. Um, that's been done. Um, now that the branch is available on the remote, let's start by uh, verifying. Yeah, we can see that the modeler.NET pipeline's there. Um, we can start creating the pipeline. Uh, rather, I should say we can start updating the pipeline uh, for it to be more modular. So let's select the branch in the create existing, create a pipeline from existing YAML file, select the YAML file, and we see that here. Let's change the name of the branch to modeler.net pipeline. And that's, you know, when we make changes to, to this branch, that's how we want the CI to trigger. Um, we're going to continue using the Ubuntu latest pool, uh, Azure hosted agents. Let's just have one good look at the steps again. All right, so let's just take uh, one good look at the steps once again, because uh, we're going to walk away from this monolith very, very soon. Now, um, Azure YAML Pipelines has great uh, documentation on MS Docs. Um, let's find that page and go in it. You see, it's listing out what we're doing. Today, we're just using steps. Steps is the lowest in the schema that's provided. One step up above that is jobs. Uh, if we look at steps, steps really just allow us to use any of these scripting languages to create uh, a procedure, uh, a series of steps. Whereas if we look at a job, a job has a more comprehensive schema around it. Uh, for example, a job is a collection of steps that can be run on an agent, on a server. It can be run conditionally, and that allows us to do some linking between different jobs. We also get some cool stuff like strategy where we could enforce fanning in, fanning out using a matrix of inputs and outputs, have a specification of which pool to run. For example, if I wanted one job to run on Windows, one to run on Linux, one to run on Mac, I could do that. So a whole raft of options available here uh, and some examples right off the bat that you could um, copy across and, and play with if you just wanted to get started with jobs. Uh, well, we're going to redo and refactor the code we have, so we're not going to copy anything. Um, I think what would be sensible uh, is let's just comment out the steps that we have and see if IntelliSense guides as well to create the jobs. And it does that indeed. If I type jobs, I can see I'm getting IntelliSense support. Okay, let's go ahead with it. Let's create our first job and let's call it build. Now, let's copy the build steps that we previously had. Um, and there's a bit of indentation trick when you're using YAML. So while the editor tries to give you enough hints by showing you dots and uh, tabs, just be aware that if you get the indentation wrong, then the pipeline will fail, although it will guide you in the failures to why it's failing. Uh, okay, let's uh, uncomment the steps that we were previously using to build. We've got essentially three steps, installing .NET Core, setting the version of .NET Core, and then simply finding any CS proj uh, and building it. Let's add the next step in there, which would essentially be the next job for us. Let's call that job test, and then uncomment the steps for tests. Uh, we'll, we'll use the, the test steps that we have. We're gonna basically just uncomment them. And in these steps, we were simply uh, compiling the test projects uh, and running them in cross-platform mode installing uh, coverlet and coverture to capture the uh, coverage report out of that. And then the last job logically would be publish, which is where we're running .NET publish to create the binaries that we would need in order to publish this um, simple application. And then we have one more step in there, which would just simply upload that uh, you know binary setup to Azure DevOps pipeline. So, uh, you know, in a nutshell, with just a little bit of refactoring and without much overhead, we've broken our monolith down into three simple jobs, build, test, and publish. Well, without further ado, let's just uh, commit this change and call it modularized um, pipeline, uh, .NET core pipeline, and save the changes. Getting there. And let's just rename the pipeline from my web to reflect the new name, which is essentially my web modularized. And once we've done that, we're good to run the pipeline. Okay, let's trigger the run. Let's select our branch. And there we go. Okay, as you can see right away that rather than just having one job in there, we we, <laughs> we have three jobs. And you see, 
that's the catch that it's it's basically run all the three jobs in parallel where it's done the publishing before it's done the test now it's done the test and it's still building so you know the plain use of jobs out of the box does parallelism you know no other configuration needed in this case there is a little bit of sequencing we need to do we need to run builds then run test and then run publish uh, so let's get into it let's edit the pipeline and build that intelligent in intelligence into it start by editing the build job uh, now it you know depends on we don't really need for the build job because it doesn't really depend on anything but we could use the timeout in minutes uh, option and give it a timeout of five minutes I mean sometimes we see builds get stuck because uh, of certain reason and then a lot of build resource time is wasted because uh, there is no higher limit specified the default higher limit is usually 60 minutes so adding that timeout in minutes to five is probably a good thing now uh, continue on error we don't really want to be continuing to the next job if this build job fails and it's probably appropriate to set that to false now in the test job we want to set a dependency on the build job and we could simply do that by passing the depends on colon builds and we're simply just calling out the string which is the name of the previous job um, and in the publish job we would add a dependency on the test job and we don't need to explicitly add the dependency on test as well as build because as long as test has that dependency on build we're sort of covered um, right let's save the changes um, and, and you know we're, we're basically just added the dependency tree um, commit the changes to the repo they'll trigger the pipeline and let's see what happens so uh, that's our pipeline triggered um, fast forward see the the build gets triggered the test hasn't been triggered and the publish hasn't been triggered unlike before um, and builds whizzing through it's completed this is triggered test and now test is in motion um, and it's going to wait for test to complete and now publish should get triggered and it does and that's complete now so we've got a sequence here um, so we've we've got a we've got a base that's working now the next thing um, worth showing you is having set up the micro structure we could extend this by using the strategy flag and adding some parallelism to it so the fanning out that I talked about before is how we would apply it we've added a strategy to to play the test uh, out into nine separate agents in parallel now the tasks that you run as part of the uh, job needs to be intelligent enough to do the slicing if you want to do the parallel work divided amongst nine uh, agents um, so in this case the test task needs to have some intelligence to distribute its tests now on the right you see I've, uh, I'm showing you the Visual Studio test task and it has that uh, intelligence built out where it can slice the test in accordance with the number of agents that are available now we're not using that task here we're using the .NET Core task so it's simply going to run the same nine, the same test we have uh, on nine separate agents. Uh, but at least you get an idea of what the fanning out would look like. So let's save the changes, um, and this will again trigger a pipeline uh, for us. Uh, let's see what happens. So um, again, the sequence and the linking build's going to run first. It's going to succeed, and when it does, at that point, it's going to move on to test. But rather than just running one test, right away it fans out and spins up nine separate agents and dishes the workload out to them. Now you can see that all, most of the tests are running in parallel. Um, and, and that again you know, brings us to, uh, to this point where it's worth showing you that you know, we're using the hosted agent uh, pool and we have a parallel job um, license for 10 jobs. If I had a parallel job license only for five jobs, then in the fanning out, five of the jobs would have been triggered in parallel and the other five would have had to wait for the other agents to become available before they would be triggered. Um, so just waiting for the final test to complete here, uh, after which this job would be classed as complete. Uh, and at that point, it would move to the publishing job. So voila, it's kicked off the publishing job that's in motion. Uh, is probably running the steps within the publishing job and as soon as that's complete the pipeline would be considered as complete and so we, we see that the pipeline's been completed 
Now, there's one more thing I want to show you here, which is uh, let's get rid of the fanning out so that we could focus on the three jobs that we had. You know, we had previously added a dependency on test that it needs to wait for build to complete. But in essence, if we're using .NET Core, our tests are running in isolation to our build. So what we could do is remove that dependency and add multi-dependency on the published task for it to wait for the success of build and for it to wait for the success of test before it does the execution of the public task. So I'm just going to add a condition here of succeed on publish and the dependency on build and test. What that would do now, if I save the changes and run it, is when the pipeline triggers, it's going to trigger the build job and the test job in parallel and then wait for both of them to complete before it goes off to do the test, uh, before it goes off to do the publish job. The advantage here is, you know, previously it was doing build, test and publish. Now build in and test running in parallel means we're probably saving ourselves 30, 40 seconds of uh, execution time. And, you know, every second counts. If, if you're a busy team doing a lot of builds, churning out a lot of code, then idly having your pipeline execution for CI under one minute is, is going to allow more change to flow through the, the rigorous uh, process that you've set up for build and test. And again, if you have a high number of test suite, then using fanning out to uh, distribute those tests for execution on multiple agents means you could even uh, work through a bigger test suite uh, and make the pipeline and the process far more efficient. Uh, so just waiting for the published job, job to finish here, and that's complete. Um, so yeah, I mean, in essence, in this module, uh, we learned about uh, dividing a monolith pipeline into more structured jobs, the advantages it offers, the isolation it offers, the additional switches that it offers, uh, net net very beneficial if uh, you want to you know do more parallelism and you want to leverage the fan out features that are available um, I hope you found the video useful uh, please subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell there's plenty of amazing content lined up uh, that I will be releasing soon on YAML pipelines if there's anything specific about YAML pipelines that you want me to cover then you know, drop a comment below and I would happily engage and create that content for you. Don't forget to check out the Microsoft Docs on YAML pipelines. They've got some good examples there. And if there's anything specific in the docs that you want me to cover in the videos, again, you know, give me a shout. All right. Thank you once again. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Cheerios. Bye.